Here comes one of my favorite Torah portions. It is Noah. But what's interesting, here we're going to talk about the flood. And right here is Noah's name is really Noach, like Bach. It's Noach. You can see the, whoops, you can see the letter noon and then the letter chet. And so it's actually Noach, not Noah. And one of the interesting things, in the ancient Hebrew, the font, just like you have a lot of fonts on your computer, the ancient Hebrew, the font looked different. Actually, the noon looked like that, where we can kind of see where we get our N, but it was a fish darting through water, and the letter noon represents fish and life. Not a dead fish, a live fish leaping out of the water. And the het was a fence, and it means to guard or protect. So in one level, Noah's name means to protect life which is exactly what he did. But there's one other thing I want to mention. I have two verses from last week's Torah portion. I didn't uh, go over. Oh, actually one. It's in uh, Genesis chapter 5, verse 1, where it says, this is the book of the generations of Adam. And if you remember, I told you the word was toldot, and it was missing a vav. Well, the word toldot doesn't mean generations. In Hebrew, the word for generations is door. And so what toldot really means is all the stories, the history. So what it's saying is not just a genealogy of who begat. It's saying this is the book of the history of Adam. It includes everything. Just like when uh, you maybe mention uncle or aunt so-and-so, what comes to mind is all the stories about that uncle or aunt that comes with it. And so the word toldot is more specific than door. Door is just a list of names, whereas toldot is not the list of names only, but also the entire history that comes along with it, the stories. Now, in Genesis 5, 28 and 29, it talks about how Lamech lived 182 years and became the father of a son, and he named him Noach. He said, this one will comfort us in our work and in the toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord has cursed. So he named him Noach, saying he will, what? Well, guess what? You take the word Noach and you add the final mem, you get the word comfort. That's why he said that. Naham means to comfort. That's why he named him Noach. But guess what? Look at what it says in Genesis 6.6. 6. It goes on to say, and it doesn't say Elohim. It says yud heh Elohim is the king, strict justice. yud heh is the merciful, loving, compassionate. And it says he was sorry that he made man on the earth, and it grieved him in his not his mind, in his heart. And the Hebrew word for grief there means difficulty in breathing, as if he's sobbing over the situation. And then look what we find in Genesis 6, 8. But Noah found what? Grace. And guess what? If you take Noah's name and you simply put the head on the other side, you get the word for grace. Hen. And so here we see Noah came to comfort us and he found grace. We'll look at Hebrews 11:7, 7, the faith chapter. It says, by faith, Noah warned of God of things not seen as yet. He moved with fear. He prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world, and he became heir of the righteousness, which is by what? Oh, my goodness, grace and faith in the Old Testament. I can't believe it. I thought only grace and faith was in the New Testament. Sorry, it's been there from the very beginning. Okay, so we go to Genesis 6, 9. It says these are the history. This is the history of Noah. It says Noah was a just man and he was 
perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. The word there is tamim is the same word as unblemished or not hypocritical. That's really what it is. Now, his perfection may be different than another generation's perfection, but in his day, as far as God was concerned, he at least wasn't hypocritical. Now, if you look at Amos 3, 3, it says, can two walk together except they're in agreement? And Noah walked with God. So that meant God and Noah were walking in agreement. Sometimes you walk with your spouse and you're 10 yards ahead or you're 10 yards behind. <laughs> and they go, come back here. All right. So uh, it's, it's walking with God at the same pace, hand in hand. Now, concerning that, look at Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 6. It says, therefore, you shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God to walk in his ways and to fear him. And this means that Noah kept the commandments. Noah walked with God in the sense of having a relationship with him. Do you go on a walk with a complete stranger? <laughs> you know, I know, especially out in the woods, not going to happen. Okay. But the one thing that was known about Noah that is mind-blowing to me is look at Genesis 6, 22. Thus Noah did according to all that God commanded him, so he did. Everything. You can go through here, and it says, as God commanded him over and over and over and over. And you're going to find out in a little bit here, when it was time to get off the ark, Noah waited two months to get off the ark until God commanded him. God was saying, come on, get off the boat, you know. But it's like Noah saying, I ain't going nowhere till you tell me. I mean, that's how he was. <clears throat> now, how many went in the ark of the animals? Did they go two by two? Well, let's look at what it says. <clears throat> in Genesis 7, 9, they went in. Two and two unto Noah into the ark, the male and the female, as God commanded Noah. But look at this in Genesis 7, 2, of every clean beast, you're to take to you by sevens, the male and his female, and the beasts that are not clean by two. And so all of the clean came in by sevens, all right? And the unclean by two. What does that mean? Noah knew clean and unclean. Pretty simple. Matter of fact, so did Adam and Eve knew clean. They couldn't even eat animals. But there was a clean and unclean because God would only accept clean sacrifices. And it's the same thing with Noah. So Noah had to know. Now, <clears throat> what do we find next in Genesis 7, 16? Those who went in, went in male and female of all flesh, as God commanded him, and the Lord shut the door. Noah didn't shut the door. The Lord shut the door. Now, what's kind of amazing about that is the Lord is also going to be the one who's going to shut the door at Rosh Hashanah. He's the one who opens the door. He's the one who shuts the door. But I don't know if you knew, did you know there very well could have been nine people on the boat, not eight? Who else could have been on the boat? Literally, physically, who was alive at the time? I'm going to show you. Watch this. Okay, let's see. Okay, look at Genesis chapter 7, verse 4. Four, God tells Noah, you got to wait seven more days now. And I will cause a train upon the earth. Forty days, forty nights, and every living substance that I made will I destroy from off the face of the earth. Well, let's take a look at the begats. Okay, here is like 550 years. Every row is like the Jubilee cycle. And Adam is up in the top corner. And then this is the year he begets Seth and Enosh, and Canaan, and Mahaliel, and Yared, and Enoch, and then Methuselah. 
And what's amazing about this, Methuselah, oops, was born in a jubilee year. Do you see that? Methuselah was born in a jubilee year. I think that is absolutely an incredible thing to know. But get a load of this. It says all the days of Methuselah was 169 years. If he was born, as uh, you probably can't see, in the year 687 from Adam, you take 687 and 969, that equals what? 1656. And the flood happened in the year 1656. Methuselah would have made it on the boat, but he died a week before, and they had to sit Shiva for seven days to honor Methuselah's death, and that's why they had to wait the seven days. When you do the biblical math and you add the begats, you can see this is what happened. If he'd have stayed alive a little bit longer, I believe he'd have made it on the boat. Now, here it is closer. There's the ark. The flood occurred in 1656. And then it says, our fact said, was born two years after the flood. And then comes Selah, Eber, Peleg, and Ru. And then as you continue down, you have Serug, uh, Nahor, and then Terah, and then Abram. And Abraham was born in 1948 from Adam. And here... He is born during the Tower of Babel. And then here, 20, uh, he's 75 years old when he leaves to enter the, uh, he enters the promised land in the year 2023, which was a Shemitah year then. So it's just kind of fun looking at these things. All right. Well, here we are today. This is this year's calendar. Here we are doing the Torah portion no walk. And I'm going to do a series now, the second half for the next month or so on the new moons. And we're starting off on a new moon. Today is the first day of the month of Heshvan. And what's amazing about that, right here is seven days before the flood when all the animals are getting on the ark. So if you want to recognize the anniversary, it's November 11th coming up in a couple of weeks. Here, Methuselah dies. And this is why they sit Shiva for a week. And this coming November 18th is the 17th of Heshvan. It's the very day the flood occurred. Isn't that amazing? Okay, now, year 1656, it's Flood is called Mabul, okay? Well, get a load of this. Let's read Genesis 7, 7 through 12 first. Noah goes in the boat with his son's wives, his son's wives with him into the ark because of the waters of the flood, of the clean beasts and the beasts that are not clean and the fowls and everything that creeps on the earth. They went in two by two unto Noah into the ark, male and the female, as God commanded Noah. And it came to pass after seven days... The waters of the flood were on the earth. It was the 600th year of Noah's life. In the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day where the fountains of the great deep broken up, the windows of the heaven were opened, and the rain was on the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. Now, some people say, well, this is based on the religious calendar, Nisan. And others say, no, it's based on Tishri. The second month would be Heshvan, not Iyar. Well, What's amazing is, look at 1 Kings 6, 38. It says, in the 11th year, in the month what? Bull. Why is it called bull? Because that's when the flood occurred. This proves it was Heshvan, you know, not Er, Because this is telling you in uh, plain Hebrew that it actually was uh, the second month of Heshvan because Moses didn't exist yet. There wasn't a religious calendar yet. So it's going by the civil calendar. Okay, and Mabul means flood. Now, let me show you this. This year also, if you want to honor it or recognize it, Thanksgiving Day 
is the very day they all exited the boat. It's, yeah, the, if you look at your Bible, it was on the 17th of Heshvan, the flood started, and then a year later when they get off, this year it falls on Thanksgiving Day, the 27th of Heshvan is the actual day they got off the ark. So this month is pretty exciting month. <clears throat> Let me explain here. Tishri 1 was always the beginning of the civil calendar for 2,453 years because that's the day man was created. And then, <clears throat> what do we see? 2,453 years from Adam is when the religious calendar did not replace the civil calendar. It was added to the civil calendar. So here is the religious calendar in black, the first, second, third, fourth, all the way to the 12th month. That's the religious calendar. But before that was the civil calendar, which began in one and went all the way around. So you'll see Tishri and Nisan are exact opposites. You see that? They're like six months apart. Okay, so now let's go to the flood. If it started on Heshvan 17 and it goes for 40 days, the flood stops in the middle of Hanukkah. This is when the rainbow first appears. It's right here in the middle of Hanukkah. This year, Christmas, the 25th, is heir of Hanukkah. But here, this is when Messiah was conceived the same time the first rainbow appeared on earth. And what do we see here? We just read, it rained for 40 days and 40 nights, which takes us to Kislev 27. And then look at Genesis 7, 17. The flood was 40 days on the earth. The waters increased, bore up the ark, and it was lifted up above all of the earth. And then in Genesis 8, 3, and 4, the waters returned from off the earth continually. And after the end of a hundred and 50 days, the waters were abated. The ark rested in the seventh month on the 17th day of the month on the mountains of Ararat. All right. You take 150 days from the day the flood, well, after the flood ended, the rain ended, I should say. This takes you, now I have these here because I like to and everyone to understand things repeat in history. This is when the three days of darkness took place. When they raided the Egyptians, when they had to take a lamb, that is Passover. Well, guess what? The ark rested on the 17th of Nisan, the same day as the resurrection of the Messiah, three days after Passover. When you put this on the right calendar and start on the right month, Wow, the ark is resting on the mountains of Ararat the same day Messiah rose from the dead. And then let's look at what happens. Then it says in Genesis 8, 5, the waters decrease continually until the 10th month. In the 10th month, on the first day of the month, were the tops of the mountains seen. Okay, well... Let's go to the 10th day, the first day of the month. Here it is. It's resting on the mountains of Ararat. And guess what? That's Rosh Kodesh. That's a new moon. Well, then what do we find? Then we find in Genesis 8, 6 through 9, it came to pass at the end of 40 days. Noah opened a window of the ark. And he sent forth a raven, which went forth to and fro until the waters are dried up of the earth. He also sent a dove to see if the waters were off the face of the ground. But the dove found no rest for the sole of her foot. She returned to him into the ark. The waters were on the face of the whole earth. Then he put forth his hand and took her and pulled her unto him in the ark. Okay, so here we go. Here it is. It's on the 11th of Av. And he sends forth the raven. Then he sends forth the dove. And now we read the dove returns. Okay? And then what do we find? Let's go to the next verse. <clears throat> now, I think it's interesting. Here it is, the 11th of Av. 
when he sends them out. And in Matthew 3.16, Yeshua, when he was immersed, think of the water, he comes up from the water and behold, the heavens are open and he saw the spirit of God descending as a dove and coming upon him. The spirit of God also, the Holy Spirit is what's represented here. Well, look what happens in Genesis 8, 10 and 11. He stays another seven days, and again he sets forth the dove. And the dove came back in the evening, and in her mouth was an olive leaf plucked off. So Noah knew the waters were baited from off the earth. So here, the next week, he says, get out of here, little dove. And the little dove leaves, and the little dove comes back, and he's got an olive branch. They say it was an olive branch from an olive tree in Jerusalem that he came back with. Well, one of the uh, amazing thing is the olive branch represents the Messiah. Well, what do we find next? Uh, let's see. Uh, da, da. Okay, uh, I want to go here. I, uh, you all know olive tree, the olive tree represents Israel. And it says in Isaiah 11, 1, there came forth a rod or a branch out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. Well, the olive branch represented uh, the Messiah, and the leaf represented the new life after judgment. Well, what do we find then in Genesis 8, 12? He says, another seven days and sent forth the dove, and it never returned. Okay, so here, the next week, we are now on the 25th of Av. He sends the dove off. But look at this. Those three weeks are the same week as the dire straits from the night. You know, isn't this amazing? Okay, here we go. That one take off. Here we are. What do we have? Okay, get a load of this. It says in Genesis 8, 13, it came to pass in the 601st year, in the first month, on the first day of the month, the waters are dried up off the earth. What is the first day of the first month? Rosh Hashanah. Isn't that amazing? It is Rosh Hashanah. Wait, let me go back and see. Yeah, here we go. So, now this year, of course, we have these eclipses uh, that happened. But it's Rosh Kodesh, a new moon. I want you to notice how so many significant events in the Bible happen on a new moon. And here it is on the sixth day. Adam and Eve were created, first of Tishri, that it lands and everything is dry so Noah can get off the boat. Well, look at Genesis 8, 14 through 17. Here it is. It's the first day of the first month. And it says it wasn't until the 27th day of the next month, okay, the earth was dry, and God said to Noah, get out of here with your wife, sons, and your sons' wives. Bring out every living thing that is with you of all flesh, including birds, livestock, every creepy crawlers that they may breed abundantly on the earth. Be fruitful and multiply on the earth. I think it's interesting. In Genesis 8, 13, it says the water was dried. And Noah even removed the covering, and he looked, and the face of the ground was dry. But he waited almost two months to finally get out of the boat because he goes, I ain't going nowhere until God commands me. I, I, how many of you, you know, you might enjoy a cruise, but after a year, don't you think you'd kind of be sick of the cruise? We like camping, but after a year, don't you want to go home? You know, here he's been a whole year on this stupid boat with all these stinking animals. You'd think he'd want to get off. But he goes, I ain't moving until God tells me to. And so he gets off. Now, let's see. Genesis 9, 14 and 15. It says, it came to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth, the bowl is going to be seen in the cloud. I'll remember my covenant between me and you and every living creature. The water shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. Well, look at Isaiah 54, 7 and 10. God says to Israel, it's only for a small moment I've forsaken you, but with great mercies I will gather you. In a little wrath I hid my face from you, but for a moment, but with everlasting kindness will I have mercy on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer, for this is as the waters of Noah to me, 
as I've sworn that the waters of Noah would never go over the earth, so have I sworn I would not be angry with you or rebuke you. The mountains shall depart and the hills be removed, but my kindness will not depart from you. Neither shall the covenant of my peace be removed, says the Lord God that has mercy on you. Then what do we find? <clears throat> Genesis 10, 21, it talks about uh, Shem, the father of all the children of Eber, the brother of Japheth, the elder. Now, some think Shem was the eldest. Uh, people look at this verse and say, no, Japheth was the elder. He was the eldest. Okay. And then look at Genesis 10, 32. It says, these are the families of the sons of Noah after the generations in their nations. And by these were the nations divided in the earth after the flood. So think about this. After the flood, we know we have the Tower of Babel incident and all the people are scattered around. But it's not until 500 years later. Um, let me see if I have it in my notes. Oh, I skipped that verse, but it always blows me away. In Deuteronomy, it says that when God scattered the nations in this verse, he did it according to the number of the children of Israel. They didn't even exist. And that's how he knew that when he divided it, he said, I'm going to have 70 children uh, from Israel. And that's what happened. That's how many entered into Egypt. Okay, in Genesis 11:2, it says the whole earth was of one language, of one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and they dwelt there. Now, let me show you something. <clears throat> this is the Mesopotamia. This is the plain right in here, okay? And right here is Babylon where they built the Tower of Babel. But what many don't realize, this was a flood plain. Okay, here we get, we have Babylon, okay, you have Karbala, this, but right here is where they built the Tower of Babel in a flood plain. So here's Iraq, Mosul is, is Nineveh, but down here you'll see that same lake, Karbala, Babylon, well, guess what? See that right there? That right here is a flood plain. This is like between mountains, and it's, it's where all the water goes, like in Sumner. <laughs> you know, there's some places that always floods because it's a flood plain. That is an area that is known as a flood plain where Babylon is. Well, they say <clears throat> after the flood, all the dead bodies are floating around, and because that's the flood plain, that's where all the people had died, gathered. It was the low spot, and that's where he decided to build, in defiance of God, the Tower of Babel upon the dead bodies. Did he build the Tower of Babel? <clears throat> now, there's one other thing. <clears throat> Excuse me. We see that um, it says they found a plain in the land of Shinar. And then in Genesis 11:8, <clears throat> it says the Lord scattered them abroad from there upon the face of the earth. They left off to build the city. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth. And from there, the Lord scattered them abroad upon all the face of the earth. And uh, Genesis 11.10 mentions how these are the generations of Shem. Shem was 100 years old and begat, our fact said, two years after the flood. That's what I showed you. And then in Genesis 11.26, we see how Terah lived 70 years, and he begat... Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Those are three brothers. Well, <clears throat> look at Genesis eleven twenty eight. It says, Haran died before his father Terah in the land of his nativity in the Ur of the Chaldees. What does it mean when it says Haran died before his father Terah? It means his dad faced his death. He died in front of his father's face. Well, let me tell you the rest of the story. If you uh, look at Joshua 24, 2, 
it talks about how Joshua said to all the people, thus says the Lord God of Israel, your fathers dwelt on the other side of the flood. Okay, in old time, <clears throat> even Terah, the father of Abraham and the father of Nahor, and they served other gods. Terah served other gods. Terah worked for Nimrod. Okay, Terah was around before Nimrod was, or pretty much the same time. And Terah built idols for Nimrod. He had an idol shop. And when it says Haran died in the Ur of the Chaldees, that is referring to the fiery furnace of the Chaldees. Just like a thousand years later or 2,000 years later, Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon threw him in the fiery furnace. He wasn't the one that started that. Nimrod did. Nimrod had a fiery furnace. And Haran got thrown into the fiery furnace, which is why Terah moved with Abram and the others, which we will go over. Now, here's the rest of the story. Abram, one time, his dad Terah told him to mind the idol shop while he went on a trip. And so here is the little idol shop that his dad was selling. And Abram's in there minding the idol shop, and this lady comes in and puts a, a little, like, a meal offering in front of one of the gods for one of the gods, and she leaves. And Abraham thinks, this is the stupidest thing he's ever seen. So what does he do? He goes in, and he smashes and breaks every single idol but one, and he puts a hammer in that one. And then his father comes back, and he sees the idol shop all torn up. And he goes, what happened? And Abraham goes, well, dad, this big idol got upset at these other idols for getting all the food, and he destroyed them all. And his dad goes, well, are you crazy? They can't do that. And so he says to his dad, well, then why do you create them for people to worship? And so Terah went and told Nimrod to get Abram in trouble. So Nimrod comes, and he throws Abraham into the fiery furnace, and he turns to Haran and says, do you trust the same God that Abram does? And Haran's waiting to see if he comes out alive or not. And he sees him come out. And so what happens? He says, yes. So then he threw Haran in. And his father saw his son die because of his worship of Terah and telling Terah or and telling Nimrod. And so, therefore, that is why they end up moving to a town called Haran after Haran died. Now, I'm almost done here. Oh, good. I still got some time. Okay, since I have a little bit of time, I don't have this in my notes, but I'm just going to mention it. Because a lot of people wonder what in that world happened when Ham went into his father, Noah, and cursings came out of Noah's mouth. Let me just open up uh, my Bible here, and I will explain that, what really went on. Uh, let me go to Leviticus 18, 18, 8. Easy to remember, 18, 8. Come on. Okay. In it, you all know the story. It says Ham goes into his father's tent, and he uncovers his father's nakedness, and he comes out, tells the brother, brothers, and they go in and cover their father's nakedness. And then Noah, you know, when he finds out what happened, who did he curse? He didn't curse him. He cursed his son. Okay. Well, why was Canaan cursed? What did he have to do with this? Okay, well, Ham's line, Ham is cursed. Actually, his whole line is cursed. It talks about, you know, even in the Exodus, to the fourth generation will a curse apply. Because, listen to Leviticus 18, verse 8. 
the nakedness of your father's wife. You shall not uncover because it is your father's nakedness. He had sex with Noah's wife. She begat Canaan, which is why Canaan was cursed. He uncovered his father's nakedness and his father's nakedness. You read Leviticus 18, the whole thing about don't uncover your sister's nakedness. Don't uncover your steps wife's nakedness. That has to do with having sex. And so what literally happened, Ham went in, had relationships with his mother. She produced Canaan, and that's why Canaan was cursed. Now, moving on. Okay. Now, what do we see here? Let's go to Genesis 11, 29, and 30. Haran has died. And so what does it say? Terah took Abram, his son, and Lot, the son of Haran, who died, his son's son, and Sarah, his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife, and they went forth with them from the fire of the Chaldees to go to the land of Canaan. They came to Haran, and they dwelt there. And it says the days of Terah was 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. So I want to show you something. Here we go. Terah and his wife number one had three sons. Haran also had two wives. This wife had Milcah, Iscah, and Lot. We know in Genesis eleven twenty-seven, 27, Haran begat Lot. Now, <clears throat> Haran dies. So I got the little thing. Haran dies. So now what happened? It says that Nahor took Milcah, and Abram took Sarah. Where's Sarah? Where's Sarah? Now, the Jewish people say Iska was Sarah. But I'm telling you, that's what's hogwash. And I'm going to show you why. First, here we go. Genesis eleven twenty nine, And the name of Nahor's wife is Milcah who was the daughter of Haran, the father also of Milcah and Iscah. So right now, Haran is the father of Milcah, Iscah, and Lot. And I will prove to you how Iscah cannot be Sarah. Okay. Get a load of this. Okay. Oh, yeah. So I wanted you to see all of them belong to Hera. Now, look at Genesis 20, verse 12. And yet, indeed, Abraham has Sarah with him, and he's going to Egypt, and uh, he, he wants to call Sarah his sister rather than his wife. And it says, and yet, indeed, after Pharaoh says, you know, what are you doing? What are you talking about? He goes, well, she is my sister, She's the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother. And she became my wife. And so what do we see? Terah and a different wife had Sarah. You following me? That's what it just said. Look at that. She is my, she's a half sister. You following me? Terah has two wives. This wife has all of them. This wife has Sarah. So she is my sister, but she's my half-sister because she didn't come from my mother. So what do we find? Now, when you understand the Leverite marriage, which even existed before Levi, because a lot of the Torah they already understood, they knew if a husband dies, the brothers have to marry the wife if they have no kids. Why does Nahor not marry the wife? He marries Milcah. It could be she is dead, or it doesn't matter because she has lots of kids. 
So Sarah was Haran's other wife, and she became his wife due to the Leverite marriage. It had nothing to do with anything but the fact, look at Genesis 11.30, she was barren. She had no child. That means she had to be married, or she'd just be called a virgin. She was barren, so she was married, and she had no child, so Abraham had to marry Sarah, whether he liked it or not. He said, she became my wife. So what do we see? Hashem kept Sarah barren from Haran, from Pharaoh, from Abimelech, so her firstborn would be Isaac. And so therefore, Iska cannot be Sarah. Otherwise, Sarah had Haran as a father and Terah as a father. It, this doesn't work. I hope everyone is following me. <laughs> is everyone kind of following me? It's a little confusing. But the only way it could have worked is if Terah and Haran had sex with the same person, which is not legal. Okay? Now, Genesis 12, 1, the Lord said to Abram, get out of your country, from your kindred, from your father's house to land, I will show you. At this time, where is he? He's in Haran, right? Well, look at verse 4. It says, so Abram departed as the Lord has spoken to him. Lot went with him. And it says Abram was 75 years old when he left Haran. Okay, so think about this for a minute. He's leaving Haran, and he's 75 years old. Terah, it says, was 70 when Abraham was born. And if Abram is 75 when he left Terah, Terah was 145 when Abram left him. So Terah lived another 60 years in Haran after Abraham had left. And as I said, Abraham was born in 1948, left his father's house into the promised land in 2023, and here we are in 2024, and uh, who knows if we're not about to enter the promised land. <laughs> Let's stand. <clears throat> Hope this was fun. All right, let's pray. Avinu Mokenu, Father King, we just thank you so much that we can dig into your word and study your word. There's so much more in there that meets the eye, and we just pray you would continue to open all of our eyes that we may see all the wonders and the depths of your Torah. And we thank you so much for all of those who see the importance of magnifying the Torah, making it honorable once again, for all of those who sow seed uh, into this earth through your word. It's through your word. And we thank you so much for any uh, tithes, donations, offerings to help get your word as a light to the nations of the world as we are at the darkest time ever. And we want to shine your light, not our light, but your light to all to see. In Yeshua's name, amen. Together, blessed are you, Lord our God, creator and king of the universe. You have blessed us with your Torah of truth. You have blessed us with the whole counsel of your living word by the power of your Holy Spirit through the completed work of Messiah Yeshua. You alone have planted among us life eternal. Blessed are you, Lord our God. Amen. Take a break. Well, what I'm going to do for the next month or two is talk about the importance of the new moon. So many people are disconnected with the new moon. As you know, our calendar is based on the sun. It has absolutely nothing to do with the moon. And every once in a while, you hear about a blue moon. What is a blue moon? Uh, yeah, all you know is it's in a song. <laughs> once in a blue moon. Okay, because our calendar is not based on the moon, some months, some times, you will have two full moons in one month like the 1st and the 31st of January. You're following me? Uh, uh, and when they call that, they call that that second lunar or second full moon in a singular Gregorian month as the blue moon, which only comes once every year and a half or something like that. 
if it was based on the biblical calendar, there never would be a blue moon. When there's an extra moon, that's when they add an extra month that year. Okay, so they don't add an extra day every four years. They add an extra month seven times over 19 years. And that way, at the end of 19 years, everything's back in sync again. Because God said you had to keep Passover in the spring. If you base it only on the moon, like Ramadan, that could be in every month of the year because they only base it on the moon. So, like, you don't want to keep Passover in the winter. And so that's why the Lord uses uh, his calendar, which uses both the sun and the moon. Okay, so the pagan calendar we use is truly a pagan calendar, even though the Catholic Church got involved, uh, because it's based only on the sun. It's not based on the sun and the moon. Very mathematical by all means. But let's start with this. Okay, God, you know those old grandfather clocks with all the gears in it? Okay, well, that's kind of what God's time clock is. It's based on these different gears. And how many of you would have wanted to have missed Noah's Ark? You got to know when to get on the boat. The boat door shut on the 17th of Heshvan. And if you don't know that, you may miss the boat. How many of you want to go on a cruise or a flight to Israel and you have the time wrong for your cruise or the flight and you miss it? Well, it's the same thing. When it comes to things of God, you have to be on his time clock, his calendar. Well, those gears that are operating every week, you have the Shabbat. Every month, you have the new moons. And then every year, you have the Moedim or the festivals. And you put that together, and you'll see you have the yearly Moedim, which includes the weeks and the months and the festivals. But then you have the Shemitah cycle, which is every seventh year. Then you have the Jubilee cycle, which is every 50th year. But let's take a minute and look at Genesis chapter 1, 14. Everyone knows this verse, but no one understands it hardly. God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night. And then it says, let them be for signs. Number one, it was for signs. That's why God created them. Not just light and heat, even though that's one of the reasons. His main reason is for signs. And then it says for seasons, days, and years. And the Hebrew word here for seasons is the Moedim. He didn't create them for winter, spring, summer, or fall. He created them for Passover, for Sukkot, for Rosh Hashanah. And the days and years refers to the holy days, the Shemitah years, the Jubilee years. But here's what's amazing. Of the six days of creation, what day was the sun, moon, and stars created? The fourth day. God thought his calendar was so important, he created it two days before he created mankind. Think about that. Man didn't come first, the calendar came first, and then God gave the calendar to mankind so they would know what to follow. And so the new moon, which is the start of every biblical month, is the most pivotal date on the biblical calendar. Because without the new moon, you couldn't have any of the biblical holidays. How can you have the 14th or 15th of Nisan if you don't have the first? <laughs> you always have to have the first. And then you can know when the other days are between that and the next new moon. And this notifies us which days are holy. A lot of people think, well, everything's holy. Well, if everything's holy, nothing is holy. There has to be things that are set apart. And as I said, this was introduced before man was created. And do you know what that means? This is very important to realize. Let me turn my phone off. Since the time clock of God was created before mankind, 
that tells you God's calendar doesn't need humanity. So many people think they have to have some cult leader find the new moon to determine a month. No, you don't. God's calendar existed long before anyone sighted the new moon. And he was doing just fine without a man sighting the new moon. It doesn't have to be sighted by anyone. And not only that, it continues whether man acknowledges it or not. If you don't believe in gravity, that's up to you. But I wouldn't advise jumping off a building. Okay, so whether we acknowledge gravity or not, it doesn't matter. It's still there, even though you can't see it. And a lot of times, even within Judaism, they say the Jubilees don't matter because we don't count it unless everyone's in the land. Well, you don't have to count it, but God is. You follow me? It continues whether we see the new moon, whether we acknowledge or not the new moon. And the same with the Shemitah year. The Shemitah year, the Jubilee years have happened since the beginning, even before man. All right. So here's the other thing, though. The months are based on the lunar cycle. The years are based on the solar cycle, all right? Every, I think everyone understands that. But there are people that need to understand that the seven-day week is only based because God said so. The seven-day week isn't based on the cycle of the moon. The seven-day week is not based on the solar calendar. Russia tried a 10-day week. Several people have tried different weeks, and they just don't work. The reason I say that is there a group out there that are the lunar Sabbatarians, and they try to say the Sabbath isn't the seventh day. It's based on the moon, and I call them not the lunar Sabbath, but the loony Sabbaths, okay? <laughs> uh, it is not based on the moon, okay? The seventh day is just the seventh day, and it's continued since creation. Now, here we see the sun and the moon were for what? Number one, signs. And you can only have eclipses on new moons or full moons. You can only have a solar eclipse on a new moon. You can only have a lunar eclipse on a full moon. So God created the biblical calendar to match when eclipses come. That's why Rosh Hashanah is on a new moon. This is why Passover and Sukkot are on a full moon. So when you see signs in the heavens, and the nice thing about this, no false prophet can manipulate an eclipse. And an eclipse speaks to every tribe, nation, and tongue. They don't have to have it translated. They know God is speaking. Now, here's the next thing. In Genesis 2.9, it says, Out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight, good for food. He created the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, in the tree of knowledge of good and evil. But look at this. The Bible begins with the tree of life, and it ends with the tree of life. Look at Revelation 22, 1 and 2. He showed me a river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb in the middle of the street, on this side of the river, and on that was the tree of life, bearing 12 kinds of fruits, yielding its fruit every month. Well, you know what? It's amazing. It talks about it's a different fruit each month. Can you imagine having an orange tree, and then the next month it's an apple tree, and the next month it's a banana tree? That is amazing. You're going to see here, uh, it's, uh, let me see. Yeah, Revelation 22, 1 and 12. It bears 12 kinds of fruit. 12 kinds of fruit. Every month is a different fruit. But here's what's amazing. How do we know the month? He says every month. How do you know when the month is going to change fruit? It's the new moon. This shows you again the fact that it says every month this is telling you its new moon is a new fruit. 
And guess what? When it says every month, it's not referring to January or February. What about during the millennial reign? Okay, look at this. In Ezekiel 46, 1, this is when Messiah is here, reigning for a thousand years. It says, thus says the Lord God, the gate of the inner court that looks toward the east will be shut six working days, but on the Sabbath day, it's going to be open and in the day of the new moon. So we'll still be keeping the Sabbath during the thousand year reign. It won't be the loony Sabbath. It's going to be the seventh day Sabbath. And look at the importance of the new moon. It's not only at creation, it's also during the millennial reign. Look at Ezekiel 46, verse 3. Likewise, the people of the land will worship at the door of this gate before the Lord in the Sabbath and in the new moon. All during the millennial reign, we're going to be keeping the new moons because that determines the months. How about eternity? Let's say the millennial reign is over, the new heavens, the new earth. Let's look at Isaiah chapter 66, verse 22 and 23. God says, as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, shall remain before me, says the Lord, so will your seed, the Jewish people, and your name remain. It'll happen from one new moon to another, from one Sabbath to another. Everyone's going to come and worship before me. Wow. Not only are we keeping the Sabbath and the new moons now, we're going to keep the Sabbath and the new moons during the millennial reign, and we're going to keep the Sabbath and the new moons during eternity. We might as well get used to it. Okay. Now, look at Leviticus chapter 20, verse 7 and 8. Consecrate yourselves, therefore, and be what? And what does holy mean? Set apart. For I am the Lord your God. I want you to keep my statutes and perform them. I am the Lord who sanctifies you. Okay, so who sanctifies you? The Lord does. Okay. God is the one who makes things holy. He makes Israel holy holy. And then he wants to fill the world with his holiness. So do we make ourselves holy or does God make us holy? We can only make ourselves holy to ourselves. That doesn't make you holy to God. As a matter of fact, look at Leviticus 20 verse 26. You shall be holy to me for I, the Lord, am holy I've separated you from the nations that you should be mine. Okay, so God makes you holy, but then we have to maintain our holiness. Okay, when you get your nice new white garment, don't go jump in the muddy water. As a matter of fact, did all that go away with the New Testament? Well, let's look at Ephesians 1 verse 4. According as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be what? Holy and without blame before him in love. Look at 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16. Now think of this. This is the New Testament. It says, but as he which has called you is holy, so be you holy in all manner of conversation. That isn't just speech. That means in your walk. Because it is written, be holy for I am holy holy. What sets us apart is the calendar. We have to use the current Gregorian calendar because we're still on earth, but we also need to use the biblical calendar if we want to have a connection to God. You can't connect to God on our calendar. You have to connect to him on his calendar. I mean, who determines your work schedule, you or your boss? Now, it's different if you're, you know, you own your own business, but typically, If you have a boss, they determine your calendar. If you are a slave, your master controls your calendar. All right? Well, we are God's servant, so he controls the calendar. Now, I think this is fascinating. Look at Psalms chapter 104, and we're going to look at verse 19 through 21. Why did God make the moon? He made the moon to mark 
the seasons. And that word is Moadim. He literally created the moon, as he says in Genesis 1.14, to mark the new month of his calendar. So we need to have our calendar and realize it's based on the new moon. And today is the new moon. That's what's amazing is I didn't even really realize that when I was starting the new moon teachings that we'd begin it on a new moon. And then it says this. So he made the moon to signify when the beginning of a month was. The sun knows when to go down. God, you made darkness and it is night, wherein all the beasts of the forest creep and the young lions roar after their prey and seek their meat from God. The lions know. How many of you know the fish know when to swim upstream? Uh, they know when to migrate. Whales know when to migrate. Birds know when to migrate. All of the animals know the appointed times to migrate. But he says in Jeremiah, but my people are clueless. <clears throat> so look at Psalms 81, verse 3 and 4. And did you know we're going to correct this in our Bible? Every English Bible is wrong. In Psalm 81, 3 and 4, it says, blow the horn at the new moon, at the full moon. It doesn't say at the full moon. It has nothing to do with the full moon. It literally says, blow the horn at the new moon on Rosh Hashanah for our feast day. It is a statute for Israel, an ordinance of the God of Jacob. That's why I have at the full moon crossed out, because that's what you're going to have in your Bible. But it is a wrong translation. Here's what it's all about. It is all about God's covenant with David. What tribe is David from? Judah. What tribe is Messiah from? Judah. Look at how Psalms 89. Psalms 89 is all about God's covenant with David. And look what it says in verse 20. I have found David, my servant, with my holy oil, I've anointed him with whom my hand will be established. My arm also will strengthen him. And then in the next verses, it says, look at what God says. I'm going to beat to pieces his adversaries, and I'm going to smite those who hate him. He's Jewish, because you didn't know. He's from Judah. He's Jewish. He says, but my faithfulness and my mercy will be with him, and through my name, his horn will be exalted. When God says, through his name, Judah will be exalted, which name of God is it talking about? Not Elohim. It's the yud heh vav -Hey. Okay, that's important to realize, and I will prove that that is the name. But it's through his name, Judah, and only the tribe of Judah will be exalted. Look at verse 28 and 29 of Psalm 89. He says, forever will I keep for David my mercy. My covenant will stand fast with David. His seed, the Jewish people, will I make to endure forever and his throne as the days of heaven. Look at verse 33 through 37. It says, nevertheless, by loving kindness, I will not utterly take from David, nor allow my faithfulness to fail. My covenant I will not break, nor alter the word that has gone out of my lips once I have sworn by my holiness. Now, if God himself swears, it's going to happen. And he says, I'm not going to lie to David. The Jewish people will endure forever. His throne is the sun before me. It'll be established forever like what? The, here we go again, and it says the moon is God's faithful witness in the sky. Whenever you see the moon, you need to think, wow, that is God's witness that he will never forsake the Jewish people. That's what I want you to think. You have to associate the moon, and just like the Jewish people wax and wane, it's just like the moon. They have a great glorious time and they go into darkness. Then they come back and they go into darkness. Then they come back and they go into darkness. That's why the moon represents Israel. 
Look at Jeremiah chapter 33, verse 25 and 26. It says, thus says the Lord, if my covenant isn't with day and night, and if I'm not the one that appointed the ordinances of heaven and earth, that's when I will cast away the descendants of Jacob and David, my servant. Okay, so how many of you know God's the one who appointed them? So that tells you he's never going to cast off the Jewish people. Numbers 10, 9 and 10. God says, when you go to war in your land against the adversary that oppresses you, I want you to sound an alarm with the shofar, and you will be remembered before the Lord your God. You'll be safe from your enemies. Also, he wants them to blow the shofar in the day of your gladness. Okay, that refers to tabernacles. In your appointed seasons and in your new moons, you shall blow with the trumpets over the burnt offerings, sacrifices, peace offerings, and they shall be to you a memorial before your God. I am the Lord your God. So God says, look, every new moon, I want you to recognize your covenant, the covenant I have with you, with the Jewish people, with Israel. And it says in another verse that whenever he hears the shofar that we blow, he remembers you. How many of you want to be remembered by God? Blow the shofar in the new moon. Look at 1 Chronicles 12, 31. It says they were to offer all the burnt sacrifices to the Lord in the Sabbath and in the new moons on the set feast by number according to the, commanded, uh, to the order commanded to them continually before the Lord. Look at 2 Chronicles 2, 4. It says, behold, Solomon speaking, I build a house to the name of the Lord my God to dedicate it to him, to burn before him sweet incense for the continual showbread, for the burnt offerings morning and evening on the Sabbath and on the new moons and on the solemn feasts of the Lord our God. And this is an ordinance for how long? And then, so we saw the new moons were kept in Moses' temple. The new moons are kept in Solomon's temple. Here, the new moons were kept in Ezra and Nehemiah's temple. It says in Ezra 3, 5, afterward offered the continual burnt offering, both of the new moons and of all the set feasts that were consecrated and of everyone that willingly offered a free will offering to the Lord. Now, I want to show you a couple of things. What they would do, there was uh, like on the Mount of uh, Olives or high, they would find a high mountain near to Jerusalem. And when they spotted the new moon, they would light a torch, hold it real high, and you're going to see way out in the distance, someone else would see it, and they would light a fire, and they would continue to light fires until they reached Babylon or Lebanon or Egypt or whatever. They would light fires so people would know when the month began. So here we have the new moon, and today is the new moon. happened last night. That's why this is the first of Heshvan. Okay, but what I'm going to start, because Nisan is the first religious month, I'm going to begin with Nisan. And so now we're going to jump into the month of Nisan. I'm going to teach you about the month of Nisan. And the next week, we'll go into the next two months and the next week. But I wanted to set the foundation first of why the new moon is even important. So I hope I've done that. What happened in the month of Nisan. What is Nisan known as? How many of you remember I talk about uh, to every Christian and they say, well, we're supposed to know the times and the seasons. And I say, great, what time is it? Oh, I don't know. What season is it? Oh, I don't know. So I'm going to teach you what the season and the time is of every month. So then we know what month we're in, what time it is, and what season it is. With Nisan, Nisan is known as the month of redemption. That's the time. It's the time of redemption, the time of miracles. It's the time for unity, and it's the time of kingship. Okay? So I'm going to prove all of those things to you from the Bible, not from me telling you because I think it's cool. Okay? Nisan is the month of redemption, the month of miracles, the month for unity, and the month for kingship. Now, what are some of the things that happened in Nisan? 
we just saw from the first service, Noah's ark rested on the mountains of Ararat the same day the Lord resurrected. Nisan 17. We talked about Abraham entered the promised land in Nisan. Isaac was born in Nisan. John the Baptist was born in Nisan. Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed in Nisan. All the miracles of the Exodus, crossing the Red Sea, all this stuff happened in Nisan. Miracles. This is a month for miracles. This is the month they crossed the Red Sea. They got redemption. You can see those tied together. This is the month the Lord resurrected. Another miracle. So here, Nisan, I have as the month of redemption and miracles. Now you can see in Hebrew, this is the word Nisan. And what makes the N sound? What's the first letter? Noon. That's what makes the N sound. The uh, Yud, which is the I, the Samek, which makes the S, and then the final noon. And though that is the word Nisan, okay? Well, what's amazing, the very word noon, Samek, is the Hebrew word for miracles. Isn't that amazing? Built within the word Nisan is Ness, which is a miracle. Uh, let's see where I'm at here. Now, let's look at Exodus 12, verse 1 and 2. The Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, and they said, this month will be unto you the beginning of months. It will be the first month of the year to you. So this is why Nisan became the first month of the religious calendar based on this verse, and it became the beginning of months for the religious calendar. And guess what? God was showing him the new moon at that time. Okay? This is the proof. Now, here is Exodus 12, 2. Okay? This month shall be, it says, for you. Okay, it's not for the nations. It's for Israel. The beginning of the month, it shall be the first month of the year for you. Here is the word, Lamed, Kaf, Mem, Lakam, is for you. And guess what? If you take the, Melech, the M and move it there, you get Melech, king. This is why it is the month of kings. Because it's the first month. So the king goes first. So you have the word king. And so we see Nisan is the month of kings. Concerning King Messiah, <clears throat> he was crowned king in the month of Nisan when they put the crown of thorns upon his head. And they had above the cross the king of the Jews. Every king of Israel based their term with Nisan 1. If you started the month, just not a year before Nisan, if a king became king in Adar, the 12th month, come Nisan 1, a month later, he begins his second year. Nisan 1 was all, Israel, all of Israel's kings, their how long they reigned was based from Nisan 1. Everyone follow that. So here, what's amazing, Messiah was crowned as king, along with the kings of Israel in Nisan. But then, for the world, he's crowned king on Rosh Hashanah as the king of the world. He's the king of Israel, set apart in Nisan. And at creation, he becomes king of the whole world, which is why the second coming is based in that month. He's taking world dominion. Everyone following me. Okay, now, Isaiah 53, 7, it says, he was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he never opened his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before his shear, her shearers is dumb, he opened not his mouth. Isn't that amazing? He's crowned king, and he doesn't open his mouth. In Ecclesiastes 8, 4, it says where the word of a king is, that's where power and authority is. He rules 
He makes commandments, any human king or whatever. All right. A king governs through his word, and he is the word. His whole life was speaking. He doesn't have to speak vocally. His whole life spoke. And look at Exodus 40, verse 1 and 2. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, on the first day of the first month, you're to set up the tabernacle. Moses' tabernacle was set up on the new moon of Nisan. And in Exodus 12, 8, it says, it's in the first month, on the 14th day of the month, you're to eat unleavened bread until the 21st day of the month that even. So here we see Passover was in the first month. Leviticus 9, 22, the very day of the opening ceremony of Moses' tabernacle. The grand opening ceremony was on the new moon. It was on Nisan 1. And look what happens. Aaron lifts up his hands toward the people, blesses them, and the fire doesn't fall from heaven. So he comes down from offering the sin offering, the burnt offering, and the peace offering, and he feels really stupid. He goes up, he says the priest is blessing, and nothing happens. And so what do we see in Leviticus 9, 23 and 20? Well, look at Psalms 133, verse 1 and 2. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together. How? In unity, it's like the precious ointment on the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard that went down to the skirts of the garment. Well, guess what? On Nisan 1 is when this happened and the oil run down Aaron's beard because Moses is pouring the oil on him and anointing him. But guess what? There wasn't unity. And God was waiting for Moses and Aaron to reconcile over the sin of the golden calf. And so look what happens in Leviticus 9, 23 and 24. Moses and Aaron both go into the Holy of Holies, and then they come out and bless the people, and the glory of the Lord appeared to everyone. And a fire came out from before the Lord, consumed the fire uh, of the burnt offering and the fat, which when all people saw, they shouted and fell on their faces. So Nisan is the month of unity when brethren and sisteren have to reconcile and whenever there's unity, that is when the glory falls. It happened at Passover. We know it happened at Tabernacles with Solomon's temple. It happened at Pentecost. Okay, all of those we found, it was when the people were unified, the glory falls. That's why Nisan is the month of unity, because Moses and Aaron got unified before God, and that is when the glory fell. What else happened in the month of Nisan? Look at Numbers 20, verse 1. Then came the children of Israel, even the whole congregation, into the desert of Zin in the first month. And the first month is Nisan. And the people abode in Kadesh, and Miriam dies and was buried. So Nisan is the month Miriam died. And then we see in Joshua, let me see something. Hmm. Okay, uh, blah, blah, blah. Joshua 4, 19. And the people came out of Jordan on the 10th day of the first month. Wow, okay. They crossed the Jordan in the first month. And then 2 Chronicles 29, 17. Here we see they began on the first day of the first month to sanctify. On the eighth day of the month, they came to the porch of the Lord. They sanctified the house of the Lord in eight days. And the 16th day, of the first month they made an end. This is a story of Hezekiah. They can't keep the Passover in the first month because they're too busy cleansing everything. And so they keep it in the second month. And look at Ezekiel 29, 17. It came to pass in the 27th year, in the first month, the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came to me. Do you realize the first day of the month is a very prophetic day? All through here, God appears to the prophets on the new moon. That's when he appears. Uh, look at the next verse, Ezekiel 30, 20. It came to pass in the 11th year, in the first month, the seventh day of the month, the word of the Lord came to me. Nisan is a very prophetic month. This is when God speaks to his people. Look at Daniel 10, four through six. It was on the 24th day of the first month. As I was looking by the great river, I lifted up my eyes and a certain man clothed in linen with Loins that were girded with fine gold, his body was like the barrel, his face as the appearance of lightning, his eyes as a lamp of fire, his arm and his feet 
like in color to polish brass, the voice of his words like the voice of a multitude. This is Yeshua appearing in Nisan. Look at Esther chapter 3, verse 12. It says, then were the king's scribes called on the 13th day of the first month, and there was written according to all that Haman had commanded to the king's lieutenants, which was what? In verse 13, the letters were sent by post into all the king's provinces to destroy, to kill, to cause to perish all Jews, young and old, little children and women in one day, even upon the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of the Dar, and to take the spoil of them for a prey. So the commandment to kill all the Jews came on the 13th day of the first month. What happens on the 14th day of the first month? Passover. This, when you understand the biblical months, you understand, oh my goodness, the command to kill all the Jews happened at Passover. And what happened? Three days later, she appears before the king. And what happens on Passover? Three days later, Messiah rises from the dead and appears before the king, the father. Esther 2, let's go back to verse 5. Now in Shushan, which is in Iran, the palace, there was a certain Jew whose name was Mordecai, the son of Yer, the son of Shemai, the son of Kish, a what? Well, wait a minute. Now, there are some people out there that are very anti-Semitic, and they'll go, I'm from the tribe of Simeon. I'm not a Jew. I'm a Simeonite. Jews are from Judah. They're all over out there, British Israelitism and uh, all of this kind of stuff. But here, Mordecai was a Benjamite, but he was called a Jew. All the Jews today believe it doesn't matter what tribe you're from. You can be from any tribe, but you're still called a Jew. Okay, and that's what people need to realize and get away from these cult groups that try to always, you know, define themselves not from Judah because they're anti-Semitic. Okay. As a matter of fact, look at Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 12. I will also leave in the midst of you an afflicted and poor people, and they shall trust in what? Okay, therefore all tribes are Jewish. Look at this. Who can tell me what letter that is? What? That's the D sound, Dalet. You can hear the D in Dalet. Well, that's the letter Dalet. And what is this word? Dalet. Okay, this is the letter, the D-L-T, Dalet. That is the letter Dalet. This is the word Dalet, okay? And what does that mean? Every word is a word, every letter is a word, Every word uh, has a me- every letter has a meaning, and that means door. So when you see just the letter Dalet, Dalet means door. So the letter Dalet means door, and that's how you spell the word Dalet. You can hear the L and the T. Well, guess what? You take the Tav away, which represents the covenant. What do you have? You have the word doll, which means poor, which is what it is in here. The poor will call upon the name of who? The Lord, which is what? The, what's this? Yudevave. Is that the name of the Lord? Well, remember, we just got done reading about the poor and the tribe of Judah. Well, guess what? If you open God's name, you open it, a door that spells Judah. That's the tribe of Judah, is God's name with the Dalet in it. That's why it's the only tribe. This is why all tribes consider themselves Jews, because they are connected to the yud hey vav hey. Pretty cool. Okay, now... The month of Nisan is a unique time for close attachment between Israel 
and their Father in heaven, and consequently, a singular great time for the redemption. This is why Messiah redeemed them in Nisan. And it is said that the last redemption will be as the first redemption. So Nisan is considered the new year for kings. Nisan, uh, Nisan 1 determines the length of the reign of the kings. Now, here's what you also, if you want to take a picture of this next one, you can. Uh, wait till I'm done. But here is how the tribes camped around the tabernacle. Judah <clears throat> went first. Okay, it's important to realize that Judah went first, and then Issachar, and then Zebulun, and then Reuben. See, these are the heads of the tribes. On the south, Reuben was the leader. So Reuben would go, and then Simeon, and then Gad, and then Ephraim, who was the head of the tribes on the west, he would go, followed by Manasseh and Benjamin, and then Dan would go, followed by Asher and Naphtali, okay? Over here are Leah's kids, over there are Rachel's kids. Now, because that's how they marched, that's how the months went. Nisan is the first month, and Judah is associated with Nisan because he went first. The next month is Issachar, uh, which is Iyar, and then Savan, followed by Tammuz, Av, Elul, Tishri, Cheshvan, which is where we're at right now. We are in Cheshvan, which tribe Manasseh is associated with. And then comes Benjamin, Tavet, Shavat, and Adar. So these are the 12 tribes in the order that they marched, as well as the 12 months. So every month is a tribe, and that is the order of how they marched. Uh, let's see. And so, like I said, in Nisan, Yeshua was crowned with thorns as king of the Jews. And on Rosh Hashanah, he will be crowned as king of kings over the whole world. Now, when you think of this as first, but who was the first of Judah that got to go? Now we're going to cut the Judah, tribe of Judah down to one person. Who is the one person that got to lead the tribe of Judah? Nakshon. Not shown. And why was not shown chosen to be the first of the first? He was the first one to jump in the Red Sea, so it split. Well, guess what? Here we go. Here is not shown. This is his name. You can see the N, the CH, the Shin, the O, and the final new. Not shown. Does anyone know what his name means? I will show you. Right here, the root word is Nachash. The leader of all of Israel means the serpent. Hmm, fascinating. Well, with that, let's go to the Bible. Numbers 10. Well, Numbers 1-7, we see of Judah not shown the son of Amenadab. He was the number one of all the ones. And in Numbers 10, 13, and 14, they first took their journey according to the commandment of the Lord by the hand of Moses. In the first place went the standard of the camp of the children of Judah according to their armies. And over his host was not shown the son of Amenadab. Well, what do we see happens in Numbers 21, 8, and 9? The Lord said to Moses, make a fiery serpent set it on a pole, and it'll come to pass. Everyone that is bitten by a serpent, when he looks upon it, will live. And Moses made a serpent of brass, put it upon a pole, and it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten anyone, when he beheld this serpent of brass, he lived. Well, look at the Gospels in John Chapter 1, verse 14 and 15, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Whoever believes on him should not perish, but have eternal life. Okay, well, watch this. Here we have the serpent lifted up on a pole. Well, how many of you have ever had to do algebra? Every letter is also a number in Hebrew. Well, here's the word Mashiach, and there it is in Hebrew. When you add the numerical value of serpent, 
and Mashiach, it's the same thing. The serpent equals Messiah, which is why as the serpent was lifted up on what? A pole. Do you know what the Hebrew word for pole is? It's Ness, a miracle. They say he didn't just lift up the pole, he threw the pole up and it just stayed up there in the heavens for people to look at. It was held up by a miracle. And guess what? If you remember, that happened in the month of Nisan, which is the month of miracles. That Messiah was lifted up. Now, who else can come up with stuff like this? Only the Messiah. And so, with that said, let's stand. Hope you had some fun. But we're going to do something different as we stand in prayer. Because today is the new moon, we're going to say the prayers for the new moon to honor this day. Oh, but wait, there's more. Guess what we're going to do this next year when we make our new calendar? We're going to have the Hebrew months be the main months and the Gregorian months be the secondary months. What do you think? Won't that be fun? So that's why I thought I'd, I better teach on these this year. So let's begin with the prayer for the sanctification of the new moon together. May it be thy will, Lord, our God and God of our fathers, that you begin for us this month for good and for blessing. May you give to us long life, a life of peace, a life of goodness, a life of blessing, a life of substance, a life of physical health, a life in which there is fear of heaven and fear of sin, a life in which there is no shame or humiliation, a life of wealth and honor, a life in which we love Torah and fear God, a life in which the Lord fulfills the requests of our hearts for good. Amen. Say la. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who created the skies by your word and all of heaven's host with the breath of your mouth. You gave them appointed times and roles, and they never miss their cues, doing their creator's bidding with gladness and joy. You are the true creator who acts faithfully and has told the moon to renew itself it is a beautiful crown for the people of Israel who are carried by God from birth and who will likewise be renewed in the future in order to proclaim the beauty of their creator for his glorious majesty. Blessed are you, Lord, who renews the moons. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us by your commandments and commanded us to be a light to the nations and has given us Yeshua, our Messiah, the light of the world. Father, we just thank you so much that not only do you want to bless us, but you want to place your name upon us, even as you told Aaron to say, Ivarekaka Adonai Ishmareka. Ya'er Adonai Panavileka Vihuneka. Isa Adonai Panavileka Viasem Laka Shalom. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace in that wonderful name. Eyeh Asher Eyeh. Amen. See you next week. <laughs>